But um, without further ado, um, I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker for today, um, Brianna Walcott, um, who is a PhD candidate at King's College London. And today, Rihanna is going to be talking to us about their research. Um, I think the talk's titled Dr. WhatsApp, Digital Communities and Misinformation. So without further ado, Rihanna, I'll hand over to you now and then um, we can have some some questions questions. at the end. Okay. so hi, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. So this talk is um, like a wee bit of a mishmash of some work that I've been doing over the last few years. So my PhD, um, well, Viva's on Monday, so we're nearly done, no kids, um, is I look at um, black digital communities online. I look particularly at spaces like um, Facebook and Twitter. And um, I've also been over the last few years working in mental health for BAME people across the UK and thinking a lot about the sort of disparities in access particularly to mental health care so that the talk will focus a lot on mental health services but of course um, a lot of those are like that obviously expands out to the healthcare system in general a lot for um, black and brown people in the UK. So um, one of the things that I was working on way back then, um, at the sort of start of the pandemic, is that I noticed um, a definite overlap in my interests here between thinking about like black digital communities and you know digital communities in general, as well as um, you know these sort of the issue of healthcare and access. I was thinking a lot about the spread of misinformation even within my own sort of family networks and kind of thinking about what ecosystems of information sharing and community support look like for BAME people across the UK and what kind of relationship to health and well-being that had and then also how that was impacted by our perhaps um, sort of fraught relationship towards national healthcare services and basically all of this sort of came together in this perfect storm towards the part of the uh, the start of the pandemic and something that um, you know we affectionately refer to as WhatsApp aunties because we have these massive WhatsApp groups. WhatsApp as a, as a platform is very important to diasporic communities in general because um, you know it takes away the whole phone card system you're no longer having to like buy phone cards or you know have expensive um, calls back to the Caribbean or whatever in my case to communicate with the rest of your family you know it's easily accessible and it brings um, you know collapses the space of the diaspora into like in a digital way so um, you know I'm a member of many different WhatsApp communities with many different um, sort of sections of my family and what I noticed in fact let me share the screen so I can show you rather than just tell you. So <clears throat> I wrote an article um, ooh, yonks ago now for the welcome uh, about about this phenomenon that I was noticing about uh, WhatsApp digital communities and the misinformation happening therein. Um, so this on the side here as well is um, an edited collection that came out in May this year called The Colour of Madness, which thinks about mental health and race in the UK. And yeah, it's an anthology that I edited along with Dr. Samara Linton. And it does talk a lot about these sort of um, communities of colour across the UK and their relationship to mental health health care. So one of the things I wanted to start out by thinking through is like sort of where we are at this point in the moment, you know, like like how how the UK looks in terms of access to healthcare at this moment in time. There are disproportionate amounts of BAME people um, who are incarcerated, um, who are medicated against their will who have um, later access to systems, who have uh, also worse treatment outcomes within the mental health services in the UK, which you might be familiar with at this point, and I can pull up some statistics later. 
So one of the things that I was working on with the welcome was thinking about how the mental health care system fails black people at this moment in time. And uh, I interviewed a number of black people about their experiences trying to access support from their GPs. And I'm just going to read out a few of the excerpts from that. If you're interested, you can um, go and find this article. It's still up. So um, from one of my interviewees, I felt like race played into those interactions so much. I felt like I was being rushed out of the room when other patients weren't and that my doctor would barely listen to what I was saying. They only started taking me seriously as a patient, as a human being, when I threatened to contact the medical authority. They want me dead as far as I'm concerned. When she spoke about her depression, her GP told her to watch TED Talks, do daily affirmations and go for a run, which actually echoes some of the advice that I've had from doctors in the past. Like myself, Tyra was sure that they would not have suggested jogging if I hadn't been plus sized. So it's this idea that there are multiple barriers towards access, that a large part of it is about presentation in the um, in the doctor's surgery. Like, what do you look like? And, um, you know, medical fat phobia, essentially, but um, intersects with the experience, also the gendered experience and also a racialized experience. Nikki also had experience of her appearance impacting her treatment. In her case, her doctor was reluctant to put her on antidepressants because she looked too well put together. My GP once said I looked too young to be in pain. So now when I go in, I don't wear earrings. I don't wear lip gloss. I remember thinking that if I showed up with acrylic nails, they would think, so you can't work, but you have the energy to get your nails done. Even though looking smart is a cultural and a gendered thing for black women, we try to be presentable. And again, this really, I think, shows the, um, where these two different cultural experiences butt heads, because there is a very strange experience in the doctor's surgery that all of these women were talking to, the fact that you have to tread this fine line between being um, ill enough to require um, help, but not so ill that you get sectioned. So there's this like very clear understanding of what we look like, how we present and how you need to present in that space that very much impacts um, the sort of performance of ill health and makes going to um, access healthcare a very full experience. Um, uh, Nikki wished that her GP had given her more information about the side effects of taking antidepressants as the stigma surrounding it in her community meant she couldn't speak openly about it. If you speak to friends or family from an African or Caribbean background who are already biased against medication, they're going to tell you to stop taking it immediately. If it wasn't for a friend with experience of medicating for bipolar 2 who told me to write it out, I would have quit because my GP didn't give me that information, what to expect and when symptoms would come and go. They just said, see you in two weeks. So this here, I think, speaks to the issue of, um, you know, the community side of things where accessing help from, you know, sort of specific healthcare issues are not always um, seen as the correct thing to do, like in a community that might favour sort of more holistic um, alternatives to medication. So the understanding that like there's a uh, a difficulty in presentation in accessing healthcare, but then also an inability to speak about it within your own community it leads a lot of these people underserved and often leads to uh, worse outcomes as people won't access healthcare treatments until it's a very desperate situation. Hence, a lot more people ending up being sectioned when they're from BAME communities. OK, so I've got a few images here that um, accompany another article I wrote specifically about Dr. WhatsApp, about these, um, these ecosystems of information that are self-guided and um, this figure here of Dr. Auntie. So some of the things in the background are taken from, um, taken from various WhatsApp chats that, that we receive. Um, the start of the pandemic felt very much like this. You can see there's like the lemon honey ginger as like the most powerful um, fight against illness. The 
COVID-19 safety measures that were often going around these group chats, the idea that gargling with salt water prevented germs from reaching the lungs and would protect you from COVID, the onion wrap, the bush tea, the Vicks vapor rub that is the cure from everything from a broken leg to a broken heart, and then, you know, the, the tablet devices here with the WhatsApp symbol and like all of this like overload of information and virus and the auntie who is here giving you all of this information, Dr. Auntie. And then the some of the things that we were told to talk about were things like, um, you know, told to, to do in the face of the pandemic, drink bush tea, take cod liver oil, wrap um, poultices of, on, uh, put a raw onion in the corner of your room to draw the infection to that onion, wrap poultices of using banana leaves, wrap a raw onion and strap it to your chest using banana leaves. And um, part of the, uh, I'm not gonna say it's not, um, these holistic, cures are cult, like so my family being from Barbados some of the like you've the island has um you know it's very small it's 166 square miles there's about 300,000 people and it's serviced by one publicly accessible hospital and one other private hospital so it's two hospitals for the entire island it might take a while to get to those islands that those hospitals that are both on the um on the west coast if you aren't um if you aren't nearby that anyway so people are used to looking after themselves to leaning on these holistic um these holistic treatments and the numbers of covid infections in barbados in particular remained very very low because people were you know staying within their homes relying on this advice almost superstitious with it so the the sort of treatments and and like cultural acts um attitudes towards medication and healthcare that trickle across to the uk i still use vix vapor rub um you know the honey lemon ginger tea that's spiked with a bit of rum for when you have a cold that stuff works it does work <laughs> But um, maybe the uh, the onion. Le I drew the line at the at the raw onion in the room, and that's when I sort of started have to get started uh, having to get involved, and um, you know doing the rounds and making sure everyone got their vaccinations and so on. But you could, you have to understand that these this perspective, this um, distrust and reliance on your own um, community understandings of healthcare and how to look after ourselves is born from a place of, um, you know, sometimes institutional neglect um, and histories of racist access uh, principles in um, in the UK institutions and healthcare institutions. So I'm not, um, please don't get me wrong, that I'm not trying to make light of all of these different um, ways that my community has of protecting themselves. Um, because Barbados did really well in the pandemic. They didn't, um, there, there were very low in case, in terms of like deaths and, and infections. So, you know, something was working. But my point is that when these, um, these bits of advice make their way across the sea, um, sometimes it, it leads to, um, well, it leads to trouble, as we can see, on this next slide where people were thinking that this uh, this is a painting of a video where like a natural light phenomenon was um, described by the WhatsApp aunties as evidence of COVID leaving the atmosphere. So, you know, there was a lot of superstition. There was a lot of um, sort of religious iconography that came into it. So up in the corner, we've got an image of Jesus wrapping the globe um, in flags. But for some reason, this image was then repurposed and now he's holding a coronavirus patient wrapped up in all the flags of the world, um, sending around texts for prayers, um, doing some 
like quick pseudo maths on the on like COVID and thinking about the Bible, and then also these ideas about uh, Wuhan's coronavirus can be cured by a bowl of freshly boiled garlic water. Um, so these are the sorts of messages that were making their way across. And I did notice, so I asked um, lots of people to send me their messages, their WhatsApp messages, um, to sort of like get a, a good overview of what was happening within these ecosystems of information. And some of the things that were in common were that people would, there would be fake names, introducing themselves and like possibly tying themselves to an institution. Um, there were often, um, you know, like the they were borrowing credibility by putting in fake names of people who were students and professors and doctors. Um, there were very like easily debunked things that I would then go up, you know, take all the messages and explain that, you know, putting a lemon into hot water can't transform it into alkaline water because lemons are acidic, you know, all of these kinds of um, sort of pseudo medical terms. And then people would just pass them on. There were also lots of hoaxes like this that were preying on people's um, or preying on a really terrible things that were preying on a difficult moment. The thing that was very confusing about the difference between the sort of misinformation and disinformation is that um, with the chain mails, I would love to know, oh, I, my life would be complete if I could find someone who started one of these chain messages. So I knew where they were coming from and what the, mo I just want to talk to them, find out what the motivation is, like what, what's going on. But, you know, you'll, if you, search any of the texts from these you'll find that they you know are from the early 2000s and then people are just swapping out the names and then the whole like copy paste text is like being repurposed for different um ailments but you know i'm really interested in what the motivation is because often and i didn't include this in the slides but you would also find that people would make videos of themselves reading it out to you know lend even more credibility to it or you'd receive um forwarded voice notes of people telling you instructions like these um because you know adding a voice adding a face to it again adds that credibility and i was just i'm still confused as to the purpose of it i understand that the reason comes out of fear and that people possibly you know passing it on genuinely think that they're doing something helpful but I'm still un unclear as to the motivation of the people who start them. I mean, this one's pretty cut and dry. Like this ended up being a scam where um, if you signed up and did this, you just, you know, handing out your details and you never get that £250 voucher, obviously, because it's not really more sense. Um, there was also two very conflicting um, pieces of advice towards the start of the pandemic. On the right, we can see apparently there's been no cases of black people catching the coronavirus, maybe because we wash our hands, chicken, rice, fruits, there's nothing we don't wash. So there's this idea that um, black people are naturally immune to COVID, which was um, a really problematic statement at the start of the pandemic. And then on the left, we have here this idea that um, we're ex we're being they're now trying to say that we're more susceptible to COVID. The devil is a liar. Everyone's lungs are the same. They're trying to infect us. So you can see this, you know, this fomenting fear of the um, of an institutional um, danger. So hence, and then you can see this then leading into low vaccine vaccination uptake and all of the kinds of conversations that people were having about the government trying to put something in us. You can see that this isn't coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of histories of um, of neglect and of institutionalized racism. Um, just like a brief aside, I've taken this from a Vice article to talk, talk about what WhatsApp did to limit um, COVID-19 related fake news, where now you can see where messages have been frequently forwarded, because at the top it says this message has been forwarded many times, and you're only able to forward on to single chats at a time afterwards, so you can no longer forward messages 
to your whole um, list. In fact, I can see here, you know, this says forwarded, but if it had been for, you know, now it says forwarded many times or multiple times. Um, I'm not going to do a reading from that because I'm taking too long. I think, in fact, I'm just going to, I think I'll call it there and say, does anyone have any questions for me? <laughs> Thank you very much, Rihanna, um, for that talk. Um, if anyone has got any questions, please feel free to um, use their raise hand.